morning, everybody. I'm really I'm happy to be here. And it's great to see such a wonderful turnout. I want to share a few thoughts with you. And I guess the thing is, is that um, baby boomers are going to live longer. They're going to retire later. They have to save more money. And they have to spend less. So what does that mean? We have to prepare those who are coming behind us because we're going to need for them to take care of us. <laughs> and that's the reality of it. So as I made my transition from being a councilwoman for 12 years in downtown and south Los Angeles, I was very focused on building mixed use, mixed income housing, uh, permanent supportive housing, housing for grandparents, raising the grandchildren, housing for victims of domestic violence, and to build a rail line, the exposition line, and to build com commercial development so that we could bring net new jobs into the city of Los Angeles with that caveat that people must be hired from not only zip codes that are highly disadvantaged, but people who have had interface with the criminal justice system, people who have developmental disabilities, uh, people who are veterans, people who need to go back to work. And so as I embark on this next phase of my life, let me just, just, just give you a little snapshot of what I do as a general manager of the Economic and Workforce Development Department and I'll wrap that back into what millennials and baby boomers have in common. The city of LA established this organizational structure um, in 2013, 2013, to promote the, uh, the, the marriage or the, the creation, the merging of economic and workforce development. Um, we in the EWDD administer key federal, state, and city resources, but the majority of our money comes from the federal government, over 40 million this fiscal year from the Department of Labor and the State of California Economic Development Department. We've also gotten an additional $20 million in workforce development grants by leveraging our federal dollars. Uh, and we use these citywide to develop programs and services to help people become job ready and actually place them. And when we do this through a system of uh, work source centers throughout the city, and we have 17 of them. Um, and it, it's a network uh, that has uh, dramatically increased the number of people served because it aligns people who want jobs to high growth employment sectors. Some examples, healthcare, green tech, clean tech, biotech, financial services, logistics, goods movement, transportation, advanced manufacturing, construction, and travel, tourism, hospitality. These, some of the centers, three of them in fact, have been located on the campuses of community colleges to create that direct link between workforce development and education. And if you visited one, um, I think the closest for you would be Los Angeles Trade Technical College. Uh, whenever you go in there, it is booming with people from, from all ages uh, engaged in activities uh, to get a job. Now, since our system was implemented, uh, 75,000 low to moderate income residents have found jobs through the system. Another 43,000 were able to access these services online. We wanted to reach, reach further in a non-traditional way through people's phones, through people's uh, computers. However, because even if somebody doesn't have a computer, most people have phones. So we established an online jobs portal and that was launched last year. It's called jobsla.org and we, we highlight it wherever I go. Uh, and we will soon be putting Jobs LA portals in all of our city libraries. One of the reasons for that is if you visit any of our city libraries, you see a high number of people who are homeless who spend the day in the library because that's a safe, clean place to be. And so there's a ready-made um, potential client base there uh, with uh, people who will be working these Jobs LA portals to reach out to people who are right there in front of them and see if they can pull them along into the system. So we have a strong use on social media, and this is where we cross over into 
talking to and working uh, with millennials. Now, we've gotten a lot of information on the millennial, what will be the millennial majority workforce. Um, and I can give you the citation if you're interested. Um, we've worked with a, a Gen Y uh, consulting firm. I think many of you already know that millennials will become the largest generation in our country's workforce. Now, the perception is, is that this is the best generation at key skills that businesses require, the agility and the ability to innovate. And uh, there's also a belief that millennials have an advantage over prior generations, that willingness and openness to adapt and to keep up to date with emerging technology. I, I think that's clearly, every time I find somebody with a flip phone, I just, I'm just baffled uh, as to why, other than maybe there's a personal sort of you can't let go uh, issue there. And nine times out of 10, there's someone who is a baby boomer. 68% um, of hiring managers say millennials have skills that prior generations do not have. And 82% of hiring managers feel that most millennials have the ability to be technologically adept. And they are perceived as very quick learners. 28% of the respondents to the study said that they are already in management positions. And 66% of respondents to this study say that they expect to be in management by 2024. Now whether that happens or not, I think that's, that's an interesting discussion and dialogue between baby boomers and millennials on what it takes to move ahead. But the interesting thing, the greatest change I think is that 50% of millennials expect to stay in their jobs fewer than three years. So there's, um, there's no long-term relationship like there used to be uh, with your employer, with a company. It's in contrast to previous generations, such as the Gen Xers born between 65 and 1981, who left companies on the average of five years, and of course, baby boomers born between 1945 and 1964, leaving in seven years on the average. And when I think about my own parents and listening to them talk about their peers who would often stay at a place for 20, 30 years or until they retired. And I don't think that'll ever happen again. This, this survey was conducted uh, among 1,000 millennials between the ages of 21 and 32 years old and they were educated, well-educated, bachelors, masters, postgraduate degrees, uh, 200 hiring managers, uh, 33 years old and up, and they were responsible for recruitment or human, re human resources within their businesses. Now, um, we also looked at another study by a Jalay Bisharat, uh, he's a senior vice president of marketing at Elon's Odesk. Millennials are open to change, he said, creative and entrepreneurial, the very qualities that fuel agility and innovation. So millennials are reinventing what it means to be successful in a technology-driven world where the work days are infinite, the needs change on a dime, and independence and flexibility are at a premium. So we at the Economic Workforce Development Department have embraced these changes and have tailored our programs to be able to respond to the needs of the clients who come to the doors. Because it's critical for us to meet these changes and also focus on skills development, the soft skills and the technical skills so we can push people into higher wage jobs. Now, the city has commissioned a number of studies that we have a workforce investment <coughs> board and this is what we're faced in Los Angeles. One out of five Los Angeles youth between the ages of 16 and 24 is out of school and out of work. So that's about 93,000 kids. And if you want to put that in perspective, 
That's about the entire population of the city of Santa Monica. To address the situation, our workforce development system provides employment opportunities through our city's higher LA youth program. And we're going to kick it off in July and it's six weeks of employment, $2,000 per young person. And they get financial literacy training and they get placed on a job. I think the thing that's most challenging is that, you know, it's pretty easy to find government placement, you know, to put kids and have them work in recreation and parks and in the libraries and things like that. And, and that's a good thing. The greater challenge is to get the private sector to come up to taking on a, a one person, two person, and expose them. Uh, to something they might uh, not otherwise see. Uh, when we have looked at uh, uh, debriefing or post uh, analysis of the summer youth program, the kids will say, well, you know, I want to be a firefighter, or I want to be a police officer, I want to be a doctor or a nurse, but never, ever, ever does anybody say they want to go into a career driven by technology. And the reason is that, because for the kids that we serve, they haven't been exposed to it. And so what I, if I leave you with anything today, spread the word among your private sector contacts that Los Angeles has a summer youth employment program and we would love to find more private placement for young people. Because our research has shown that there's a very close association between education and employment. And the young people with a higher level of education were more likely to be employed and mix school with work. It enhances their academics and enhances their skills. Now, as millennials grow and prosper, this out of school and out of work population of young people will be left farther and farther behind. And you know, I've been lots of conversations about why, why is there poverty? Why, how does this occur? Here's an example right here, but it is, a, it is a situation that we have the capacity to redirect, to disrupt, and to make sure that we don't leave people behind through the use of technology. Now, without work experience and education and necessary technology skills, these out of work, out of school kids will not be able to compete for jobs that focus on skills. So these groups within the millennial group face a number of challenges in, in, in today's world. So one last few last thoughts I'm going to leave you with. The challenges faced by young people in California in a post-recession economy. And it was issued by a very interesting group called the Young Invincibles. And it's fresh off the press sort of May the 7th. And they made some really interesting suggestions about young people who want to work, they set out on a path towards a sustainable career, they're frustrated by the number of barriers, including student loan debt, uh, jobs that don't take into consideration school schedules, and shrinking financial aid that necessitates absolutely working to earn a degree. And of course, these young folks are very interested in a livable wage. So they proposed some policy solutions. And I'm just going to give you their top three. They'd like to see the enactment and enforcement of fair scheduling practices that, have, that deal with young people working in retail and service industries that have predictable schedules and advance notice of when they'll be required to work so they can set up a class schedule and go to work. They've also recommended that California's career technical education programs receive a boost in funding so that young people can get that on the job training that they can, so that they need to compete. And then the last thing they said, and I don't think this is unreasonable, apprenticeships to provide paid early career learning to adult, adults. Summer youth is an example of how that can be done. 
Now, to meet their needs, we've enhanced our partnerships, our public-private partnerships through a number of different programs, through our summer youth employment program. Uh, last year, we connected over 10,000 young people, and that was great, but it was really hard to raise the money and get the placement. And the truth is, is that 29,000 kids registered online, but we only had the resources to place 10. So we've launched it again, and uh, it will be announced publicly July the 1st. And it's designed you know, for the kids who are 14 up to 25 to have that first time experience, but it does require a cooperative effort. And um, you know, again, we need placement in the private sector, but we also have a youth source uh, system that deals with disconnected youth, 16 to 21. And that's intended to prepare young people so we can move them into the work source system and help them become job ready. We link economic and workforce development programs along with a robust business source system. We have nine sources for that and we have development partners through those uh, public-private partnerships to assist small businesses, entrepreneurs, startups, incubators, to provide basic training on how to start a business, information on tax credits, and access to capital, and of course, loan packaging. Our partners have been able to secure over $29 million in loans over the last three years. Um, we, we assist small businesses throughout the city by providing uh, financing strategies that private lenders may not be able to accommodate. And we make loans in a range of fifty dollars to $450,000 uh, for things like operating costs, inventory equipment, working capital, and leasehold improvements. And we continue to build out our partnerships, and of course, the private sector plays a very, very big part in that. Uh, our referral network has been forged between all systems uh, to make sure that we get coverage if somebody needs work source help, if a young person needs wraparound services, so ultimately we can take them into the work source system and ultimately help them start their own business. That's what we're all about, networking, outreach. And given the needs of the 21st century to hire for skills rather than personality, it's critical for us to prepare our workforce um, for the economic development efforts that remain. I wanted to just tell you a quick story to close. You know, one of our work source centers is run by the United Auto, Auto Workers and it's located on Jefferson uh, near University of Southern California. They had a speaker there and he was a man who was 55 years old and had been in prison for I think 27 years. So he had committed a serious crime. And when you think about the fact that he'd been in jail for that long, and all of the technological advances that he had missed, um, coming out of jail, coming out of prison, he was already starting out as a deficit. So his counselor said that an oil company came in and they wanted to interview people to run the yard uh, on, on the um, oil company and to make sure that the workers were, you know, on the job and organized and focused. And he was looking for younger people to hire, um, but he met this gentleman and this gentleman's colleague. He had also been in prison with him. And they had spent a lot of time, you know, sitting in the day room, keeping people in check, um, you know, with their psychological skills. <laughs> Uh, and some may even call them leadership skills, mm -hmm. even though they were in an environment that the, where the environment in which they were was perceived as one that would, could be construed as very negative. Anyway, he watched them both, he talked to both of them, and he hired both of them. And I remember the gentleman said, so we were hired to run the, the yard and to keep the knuckleheads in check. <laughs> and, you know, if you think about it, this, this redemption and this recalibration 
and to refocus and to recognize that skills don't always come in packages that you immediately recognize or you know might not be a part of your value system. That's what doing this has done for me. When I look at that man, I mean, and he was just filled with joy. I mean, he, he makes nearly $30 an hour now. He has medical benefits and the whole potential for a pension. He got married, bought a house. Uh, you know, he's living the life and he's happy and he's contributing. And then I think that's, that's, that's what it is about for me. It's, it's more than the statistics. It's, it's more than, you know, emerging labor markets and high growth employment sectors. It's about actually reaching in and finding people who need a gap filled and to prepare them for that, no matter what age they are, uh, and then put them on a different path so that they can take care of their, themselves. And obviously when they do that, they'll be able to take care of their families too. And so to me, that's, that's disruption, innovation, and uh, leadership. And that's what I practice. And I try to do it and use technology to implement and to reach as many people as possible. So with that, I also have some handouts, which I didn't want to give them to you beforehand, because if I was boring, then you'd be reading them while I was sitting there. And then, uh, you know, I'd be looking at you reading, reading them, and you know, then I get all irritated and everything, and start taking pictures of you. You know, and then tweeting them while I'm standing there. So, um, you know, I have a tweeting addiction and I'm trying to overcome it. Um, um, I'll take, do you want me to take it? Yeah, we're going to do Q&A. Okay. So, uh, we'll do Q&A. So, I'm going to pass this mic. Can I borrow this? I'll trade you. There you go. Uh, so, I'll pass the mic to John. Raise your hand if you've got a question. And um, I've got some, some quick hands. Uh, so stand up, say your name, um, ask a question. Um, let's try and leave this to questions for the speaker um, and keep advice and um, counseling. No, no political manifesto? Yeah, exactly. Oh, all right. Well, I've got a political manifesto. That's right. <laughs> so I think one thing that's really been overlooked by the people in government is the amount of jobs that are getting, take high skilled jobs that are getting taken to British Columbia, Canada where they have a 58% tax incentive to technology, entertainment, animation. And it's devastated thousands and thousands of jobs in this community. I'm just wondering if you're aware of it or um, anything that we can do for these overly incentivized credits, either in the UK or in British Columbia, Canada, or in fact, Montreal. You know, it's funny, I was just out over at the Canadian consulate yesterday um, so that's kind of weird that you, you would say that, because they were talking about that. Um, when we were talking about the fact that incentives, incentives for things like feature films in particular, because that's where the big money is, um, it's a constant blood bloodletting because states constantly up the ante. Uh, in California, as you know, the governor loosened uh, the restrictions on it and it has created a an uptick in feature films, um, and uh, I, you know, I don't know what else to do other than to continue to focus on creating additional incentives uh, to keep people here or to attract them to come and stay here. But you have to recognize that it's a never-ending process because the ante is always going to be upped, and um, you know, we, yeah. Okay. Uh, the one one point about it that's really traumatic is, say, you were at Sony. Mm -hmm. And there is a big exodus of people up to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. They once were full-time employees here with benefits. Right. They get a one-year contract in British Columbia, or maybe two years, give up their, their job here. If they have property in the States, they risk double taxation in the States up there. Mm -hmm. On top of that, the real tragedy is to keep their employment and their specialty skill, they're forced to give up their American citizenship mm -hmm. and become Canadian citizens. Even if they stay for a year? If you want to stay, if you want to stay longer and have mm -hmm. a full-time job like you did in the States, mm -hmm. you essentially have to give up your American citizenship and pay about $7,000 worth of lawyer fees. I'm to sorry, can you just leave this question? Thank you. All right, yeah, well, but anyway, okay, so the short, short version is, is we have a, a film um, person in, in the office, and I've always, I always ask her these questions, and what she tells me is it's the below-the-line people who don't really have a voice, 
and the heads of the studios who benefit the most and until somebody is able to shift that balance uh, you know it's going to continue to be a fight Over here. Thank you. hi uh, Chris Chalmers um, first of all thank you for kind of it was an eye-opener to hear that uh, the size of the population of Santa Monica mm -hmm. for that age group is, is out of work it's uh, it's huge um, you mentioned that 29,000 children from or uh, people from 14 to 25 I think um, wanted to take part in that summer youth program and only 10,000 were actually placed um, due to lack of resources. 10,000, yes, 10,000, um, due to lack of resources. Yes. What kind of resources are necessary and how can we help to uh, get those resources to you? Okay, first of all, I put, put all this up on Twitter, so if you all wanna get on Twitter, everything's there. So there's three, and you can go to the website too. Three ways to help a young person. One, we have a 501c3, and our Workforce Investment Board, if you want to help somebody, you can just donate $2,000 to the 501c3. Everything's online. Or you could hire someone for six weeks as part of this program and put them on their pay your payroll and then, then take them off. Or, uh, you know, if you, if you need a subsidy, uh, hopefully we have raised enough money uh, to subsidize maybe a smaller business who says, I'll take one kid, but I really can't afford $2,000. And then if you can get me the money, I'll, I'll take the young person and train them. So three ways, but we need private sector placement um, so they can have an experience that's more than just being in the park for the summer and doing irrigation uh, or shelving books in the library. And not that those are bad things, because they're not, and those are particularly good jobs for the kids who are like 14 to 16. But once you start getting older, um, they need more intellectual uh, uh, opportunities to prepare them to go on to school and you know, to be, socialize them so they can be in the work world mm -hmm. and be successful. Hi, uh, Ken Goldstein, thank you so much for your comments and your commitment. Um, I spent a wonderful day about two weeks ago with the Right Way Foundation, who is preparing a lot of the kids that you're talking about for these summer jobs. They're wonderful kids, they have great commitment, but as I work with them one-on-one, -on -one, their math skills are almost non-existent. And if you look around this room, 90% of what we're doing here, it's software engineering, is going to start with math. I'm not talking about calculus, I'm not talking about programming, I'm not even talking about algebra, I'm talking about math. And if we don't get the kids on some kind of a math readiness path so that we can take them as interns, I don't know how we can put them in those businesses. We would love to take those kids as interns. We place them all the time. But if they haven't got the basic math skills, it's a tough transition. So what can we do to bridge that gap so that when they do get the interview and somebody does ask them a question, they are able to solve an algebra problem, which tells me I can teach them computer programming. Right. So some of the schools, uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, engage in, in STEAM and STEM, and uh, uh, with an emphasis for boys and girls. I know that uh, there's a very active program, for example, at Crenshaw High School, um, you know, where the, the kids are teaching the adults, uh, actually. And so there are a number of advocates in some of the uh, LAUSD high schools and organizations that focus on STEAM and STEM in South Los Angeles and areas where people may not have that opportunity and exposure. And I, I guess I would suggest, and obviously you can, you can contact me if you want, um, to build a relationship with an organization that is building a pipeline uh, to be able to do that. One, one organization that I can tell you is building a, a pipeline based on math skills and logic skills is the YWCA in its relationship with Xerox and their, their move towards a digital learning academy with advanced manufacturing um, so that Xerox is making sure that they are getting all the skills that they need which includes a heavy dose of math because they're training their own pipeline. You know, and then their guarantee at the end of all this training, at the end of a two-year degree or a four-year degree, is a job with a company like Xerox, because these young young people will all be ready to be trained in their technology. So, and the, and the basis of that obviously is logic 
and mathematics. So if you're interested. I'm already doing it. I want to make sure that the public private partnership yeah. is closed at Circle so that when they do have the opportunity and they get the meeting, yeah. they're ready to discuss that skill set. That's my that's yeah. My thing. Yeah, and I mean, some, some companies are doing it with nonprofits, but not uh, clearly not enough. You know, and I, I have to say, Xerox uh, is leading the way. They got recognized at the annual dinner uh, for the YWCA, and people were so overjoyed that this company has made um, an incursion into a community that has traditionally been left behind. Uh, and to be able to train these kids to be a feeder system into that, that doesn't happen every day. Over here. Hi, I'm Steve Bessard. You talked a lot about the uh, abilities of millennials. There's a lot of proud baby boomers in this audience who are also innovative and agile. But are there some skills that the millennials could learn from the baby boomers and what would well, absolutely. Um, I, I think I, I, I'm on the tail end. So, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Social skills, how to actually write, write in depth, uh, to be expressive, to, to be able to communicate um, to people not only with emotion and uh, to convey a message <coughs> that connects you to other people that you can only gain through life experience or having gone through experience um, I mean I can think of countless examples I wrote uh, uh, an email this morning to somebody in Italy uh, in the Tuscany region in a town where my uncle who was a Buffalo soldier and fought in the 92nd Infantry. And as a young child, I was very fascinated with the history of my parents and my, my grandparents and where they came from. And, and spent a lot of time asking questions and, and it's a way of learning you know, your own oral history. Uh, we called my uncle the griot or the storyteller. Um, and that's something that millennials can learn from baby, baby boomers, that is a lost art. It is a lost art, the lost art of socializing and socialization, of being able to just sit and have a conversation and actually listen and then translate what you hear uh, into some kind of an action. Uh, the life experience that someone has had. I hope to be able to go to Italy, to this town, where my, my uncle's uh, unit fought, and they saved this town, saved these people from a certain death. It was the first time these people had ever seen someone who was African American. And so each year since that time, they celebrate them. And he, he my uncle went every year until he was too sick to go, and he passed, and so his, his comrade, colleague, asked me to come and walk in his steps. Um, now, for me, that's kind of the difference. There's the connection to my past, the teaching and the passing on, not only from my uncle, his colleagues, to my daughter, who's a millennial, so that I hope that she'll carry that on, carry that story on, understand who they were and that they were, in fact, related to her, and then learn something from it and, and, and try to implement that in her life, whether that is understanding that people have commonalities, doesn't matter whether you speak the same language, doesn't matter whether you live in the same country, but you know, there's right and wrong and good and evil in the world and I think that's the difference that um, baby boomers bring and can give to a millennial, a human passionate um, relationship built um, life experience that you can teach that they may not have. And it's the little things like when the young kids come in for job interviews and they come in like this. They'll come in like this. They'll come in like this. Come in like this. 
And as they're waiting for an interview, they're texting because that's what they do. <laughs> you know? But you can't text somebody when you're interviewing. You've got to look <laughs> them in the eye, you know? You've got to see who they are and be able to reveal yourself as much as possible. And I think as older people, we can teach younger people how important that is. Because that's a true connection. We have time for one last question. All right, uh, Joan Horvath. And I have a um, millennial business partner, so I've been sitting here smiling through your last bit there. Um, what we're trying to do is to come up with something we're calling the new shop class, and we've been successfully implementing that in a private school. And we're trying, we've been writing some books to scale it because a lot of people came into science and tech through shop class, which as you probably know has been discontinued in almost all counties in California. So how would we interface with the city to try to scale something like that up? Well, how, how old is your, what's your target demographic for you know, what you're doing? Um, teachers of middle school. Okay. Um, that would be fairly easy. Um, you know, we could work with you to put together um, a networking opportunity uh, for the teachers who do that or have an interest in it and come together and do a demonstration uh, about what, you, what your capabilities are. I saw that at the Digital Learning Academy, uh, the latest techniques for making 3D uh, um, samples of things and teaching the kids how to do that. I think that's exciting and you have some of the young people put on demonstrations about what they're able to do uh, and uh, then of course put it on social media so you can see it far and beyond where you are in that room and uh, I think you would attract quite a few people. And I think these young kids, when you get 29,000 kids signing up and they don't even know what they're going to do, that's sheer hunger, hunger for something and we have to meet that. So let me know. I'm going to, and we have handouts, so just. Yeah, we'll, pa we'll pass okay, these pass out. Would you mind okay. helping okay. help me pass these out? Yes, I would not mind. Oh, yeah. Yes, those. Uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. What a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so we really appreciate you taking time in your day to come out and speak to our group here. Anytime. So we have a group of, you've given us a lot of really good insight. We have a group of 100 plus people here from the local community, innovation, community. Um, what kinds of things can our group, either as individuals or as a group, do to help you? Help. The way you can help, help me is to challenge me, to join me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Of course, old people are on Facebook. But, um, you know, you got to talk. You got you know, you to still talk to folks my age. Um, and, uh, Talk to me and let me know what your ideas are. And, you know, I, I was driving out here this morning and I called somebody from an architecture firm because I had seen an eight minute video by their graduate students on creating communities that are self contained. They're self contained with their water, their energy, and their transportation systems. And what I, I told them, let's, let's do a demonstration project. If you can think of a demonstration project you want to do, call me and let me know. We'll work together. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right.